You're actually on the spot where I had one of my high school jobs, <laughs> which is really funny because yeah, okay. back then this wasn't a bunch a of laboratory. cubes. laboratory, yeah, yeah. It was, a historic uh, building. It was an assembly line. Mm -hmm. Who yeah. are you? I'm Bernardo Huberman. I'm a senior fellow at HP and the director of the Social Computing Laboratory here at HP Labs. Wow. And why is HP doing social networking research? I mean, I, I, well, I thought the, HP is like a computer company, right? Why, well, why? okay, the question is what is a computer today? You see, yeah. that the, the HP used to make, you know, they still do make a lot of artifacts with blinking lights and all that and so on. That's very important. But we are moving basically with the times. I mean, computing has essentially migrated into all sorts of spheres. I mean, you just were taking a video with a little phone and sending it over the cloud somewhere else that I can see it and so on. So we believe very strongly that as the computer has become a pervasive thing in our society, the biggest impact is not just technological, but it's also social. Yeah. So uh, our lab focuses on the interaction of very large groups of people, social behavior and information technology. That's the way people decide today to buy things. Yeah. Most of the artifacts that you just showed me are all interactive, yeah. and you interact with others, and you share with others, and you buy and recommend with the help of others, and you watch movies, and you interact with media, and so yeah. on. So the artifact itself is not as interesting as what it can do. Yeah. And um, whereas uh, we are trying to add a lot of interesting functionalities to our products and so on, we're also interested in understanding uh, how people behave when they interact with technology, and that understanding helps us design better products. Now, when I say products now, we're not talking about an artifact, we're talking about say, a website through which you buy in HP Shopping, the way you interact with uh, Hewlett Packard or any other website for that matter, yeah. the way people look at news, uh, the way people migrate from one very hot source of uh, news and so on to another and so on. So that's basically yeah. what we do. And it, it, there's always migrations. I mean, I remember being in Silicon Valley and we used to do all of our computing through a BBS, right? Mm -hmm. and people would call into my friend's garage and download a few files and then un disconnect because it was very expensive to stay connected back then. And then we moved to uh, Prodigy and then we moved to AOL and then we moved to CompuServe, then we moved to Usenet and then, and then we moved to the web, right? And now the web, you're seeing migrations of people from website to website as they get better or, or worse, right? And interesting, interestingly, from what you say, you know, the, your, your old example of uh, BBC and so on, today this cloud computing is another example of people essentially migrating their computing to remote sites and servers all over the world that, that it doesn't really matter where they are. And so for me, the, the whole issue of how is it that people interact with that technology and interact with each other because they are using it to interact with each other is extremely interesting and a source of a lot of very good insights. Yeah. Um, what kinds of stuff are you studying right now and what are you yeah. learning? I know you put a, a graph up here. What's this graph? Oh, this graph uh, is actually part of a, an essay I just finished writing on, on social attention. It's, uh, that graph represents the recommendation network for a particular set of books in Amazon. Uh, millions of people go to Amazon, buy things and recommend and so on. We were able to get data and do, did a very good study on, uh, by good I mean very large scale study on viral marketing. Yeah. And so the dots are basically people who purchase something and uh, the links are to other people that recommend it. When you see a red dot is someone in that group bought and recommended and so on and we see how it propagates. Yeah. The, the work I'm doing uh, it is basically my own reflection on the fact that because information is so easily available today, the web, search engines, and so on, it has lost its value. No one really pays for information any longer. Yeah. Uh, you need to go to, a, you know, you want, you want to go to a site for vacation, you want a hotel, and so on, you just go to the web and find hotels and recommendations and so on. Yeah. So the only thing that is valuable in life is what is scarce, and what is scarce is attention. Uh, the ability that we have to devote our, you know, our you know, mental capacity and our eyes and so on to something that is happening in front of us. Yeah. And that is limited and therefore very valuable to all of you. You as a, you know, as a fast company, you need to access people and you need to get their attention when they look at your um, content and so on. 
we as a company need people to pay attention to our products, to buy them, to pay attention to what we describe them as and so on. So the, this whole idea of having a new scarce commodity called attention shifts now the, the focus that at least of our own research to how is it that people attend to things. Yeah. Now this is not a psychology lab, we don't really study or you know are that interested at how what is it that happens inside of your head or my head not because it's not an interesting topic but because it's been researched for years you know in psychology yeah. departments and so on i'm interested in a different kind of attention i call social attention which is the is measured by the num the intensity and the number of signals or people attending to something so when you say uh, how many people look at your um, fast company website? How many people attend to the news on, on Yahoo, on the New York Times, on The Economist, and so on? That's the kind of attention we are interested in. And that attention is mediated via social interactions, social networks like MySpace and Facebook and LinkedIn and so on. I see something I tell you, you tell others and so on. This is the graph that we are talking about now. And people act on the basis of that. And at the same time, People attend to things, and uh, as we said before, uh, we, we get tired of it. Our attention fades. So we are studying how is it that the attention of millions of people fades in time when they look at a piece of news. Yeah. Uh, we did a study of... Uh, I call that the, the half-life of a conversation. That's and, interesting. And it mm -hmm. varies from service to service. For instance, on Twitter, the half-life is two to five minutes. Um, after after 10 minutes, the conversation goes away, right? But on friend feed, which has a, a ability to have a, a more of a conversation, mm -hmm. the half-life can be 50 minutes or even longer because um, people will keep coming back to the conversation and keep bringing it up to the top of the page by participating in it. And uh, so it lasts longer than on mm -hmm. Twitter because the Twitter, the, the conversation, so I have an utterance and it goes away very quickly. It goes away out of everybody's uh, view view very quickly and the only way you're going to find that later is to do a search and it's by then it's uh, too too old to have a conversation about it. It's very interesting uh, uh, what you're saying because we just finished a study on dig, dig.com, yeah. where we measure the half-life of news stories. It's 69 minutes, it's about an hour. And it's again the same phenomenon you just described. We were able to actually predict how it would decay. And then when we measured it, it was about an hour or so that a news, you know, a link essentially appears on the front page and eventually fades. Interesting. How so. do you know about this research? So <laughs> we're studying the same thing. I'm not doing it as a researcher, but as a participant. Right, right. And, but I'm seeing the same kinds of trends. So you see, once you notice these trends, then you start asking yourself, given the fact that people will spend or, it, or the news story will have a half-life of minutes to an hour or whatever, what is it that you do in order to uh, um, enhance the experience of the user? Uh, a typical example is if you go to a website that is a news website, should you put the most novel things on the top or the most popular? Yeah. So we've been studying the interplay between popularity and novelty at eliciting attention and how long does attention stay and yeah. so on. Okay. But, but there, uh, if you're designing a news site, you need to, uh, you can have the McDonald's, right? McDonald's is very popular. Mm -hmm. But if you ate nothing but McDonald's all month long, you would be fat and out of shape and right. sick, probably. Right? So absolutely, and so we, what we are very interested, in, and I am particularly interested, and in, that's part of my research as well, is how do you essentially design a, a site or whatever so that it will provide you with diversity, novelty, and popularity in such a combination that yeah. people will find it useful and keep returning to it. Um, the same thing, you know, you talked about McDonald's. You go and buy equipment, say, from Hewlett Packard on, on our website and so on. How do we keep that website not only refreshed, but offering you of the thousands of products that Hewlett Packard today sells, the ones that we think are most relevant to you, the particular user, and so on, yeah. okay? So that, that is a very, very interesting uh, thing. And there is a, a flip side to it, which is millions of people also decide what is good and what is bad, what we should buy, what is not important. And so one piece of our research is understanding how is it that opinions form on the web. So we look at millions, millions of reviews of books and movies and so on to discover what is it that happens there. Uh, have you learned some key things? Very, very important ones, as a matter of fact. Um, Can you give us a couple? Yes. Uh, for instance, there is a very big difference on opinion formation on the web as opposed to offline in the real world. Hmm. And in real world, there is a phenomenon that was reported in the early 60s that is called group polarization, that if you have a group of people uh, discussing a point or making, you know, coming to arrive at some opinion, 
it, something rather unusual happens, which is the most extreme opinion is the one that ends up prevailing, which is very counterintuitive. This was work that was done at, um, in the East Coast and many other universities. It's called group polarization. The group eventually goes towards the most extreme as opposed to the most moderate, which is rather surprising. It is. Very and there are very, very interesting outcomes of that. There, there is a, a rather a very interesting um, set of articles uh, published by people in the law, at the law school, at Chicago Law School, uh, Cass Sulstein and so on, analyzing the implications of that for our society. Now, when you go to the web and you see how opinions form about books and movies and products and so on, we see no evidence of group polarization. The opposite, we see that op um, opinions tend to be more and more moderate. And the reason for that, we believe, is when you really look into what does it uh, take for someone to write a review and so on. So there, there you are, you write a book or you saw a movie, you can rate it, that's one thing, but writing a review means that it's costly for you. You have to think about it, it's an effort. So if say 150 people say this was a great movie, why would you bother to write yet another review you know, that says the movie is great. Yeah. But if on the other hand you disagree with a prevailing view, you would tend to then write a view. Yes. Or, or a review of the book or movie and so on. So what we think is happening is that out of that pool of millions of people, only those that are essentially disagreeing with a prevailing uh, opinion are the ones that are going to invest the time to write a review. Yes. And so what we see is that you see, we, we actually study this very, very carefully. You see books that have top ratings and top reviews, and as time goes on, the review starts getting slightly worse and worse and worse and worse. Yes. Never into a situation where it says this book is terrible, but it much, much less favorable than say it started. The opposite is also happening. Movies that are considered terrible at the very beginning, reviews essentially start appearing that say the, the, you know, the movie or the book is actually better than what others said and so on. And actually this, uh, we just finished uh, uh, writing a paper on this. It's a very interesting finding. It also gives us a sense that you can almost manipulate the way um, reviews or opinions are made by just essentially altering the time at which you essentially you present them. You can choose all the good reviews to be presented first and then people will start writing reviews that perhaps will be slightly negative and vice versa. And the so is it better to start with a good review or a bad review? Well, depends on what you want to, depends on who you are you. Are you the reviewer or are you the person who owns the website or are you the person who wrote the book? Okay. Yeah. And so the, the interesting thing here is, you know, you were asking how does this relate to what Hewlett Packard traditionally does. You see that this is now getting into um, a domain that has to do with marketing, with public relations, with media, and so on. But this is the whole interface of any company with the world. So it's not just the products that you're essentially uh, you know, selling and the services and so on. It's also how this essentially interacts with the people that are buying them and how they perceive them wow. and so on. Okay. Well, very cool. Anything, any last thoughts? Because we have about one minute. Left. Well, we, I wanted to mention a couple of other things that we're doing. We have a nice project called Water Cooler that essentially pulls all, I can show it to you, it's very nice. It takes all the blogs written by thousands and thousands of employees at Hewlett Packard. We're more than, I don't know, 150,000 people now. Okay, and then you can actually look at the zeitgeist of what is the conversation inside HP at any given moment. I can actually show it to you. Okay, right. and what else? Was there anything else? Well, one minute, that was uh, basically it. We're, we're doing a bunch of other things as well. We, we have a, other projects. But if you were going to talk about social computing, perhaps we should stop here. Okay. And you ask questions if well, you Well, thank to. you very much. Great. This thank has you. been a very fascinating conversation. I yeah. wish I could spend more time because uh, it's you. all topics that I care about a lot. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell. <laughs> You're doing research here as well. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks.